You are you have been put on hold by the host. You cannot listen or talk until the host releases the hold. You are muted. You can mute or unmute yourself by pressing star 6. You are unmuted. Any progress yet? Sorry, folks, hang tight. We're still resolving the technical issue. Hey folks, this is uh, Aaron with IT. I just got the word that's okay to continue the meeting, so go ahead and uh, proceed. Okay, I'm on live. Great. So we will go ahead and uh, commence. Uh, that first opening was just a dress rehearsal. Thank you all for participating. Uh, good morning, everyone. Woman Monica Rodriguez, and uh, I would like to call this meeting of the, uh, the special meeting of the Public Safety Committee meeting to order for Thursday, May, 20, May 7th, 2020. Uh, I'd like to invite the public to uh, please call in at 669-980-6833. Um, colleagues, if you uh, could please mute yourself because there's some feedback unless you're speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, again, the public can call in for uh, general public comment or items posted on the agenda at 669-900-6833. Uh, the meeting ID number is 987-0899-4173 pound. And uh, Mr. Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Council Member Rodriguez. Present. Council Member O'Farrell. Present. 
Council Member Buscaino. Council Member Rue. Present. Council Member Lee. Present. Thank you very much. And uh, we are waiting. We have uh, no public speakers uh, on the queue at this time, so we will go ahead and close general public comment. Uh, colleagues, I'd like to call items 1 through 9, 12, 14 through 17 on consent. If there are no objections. No objections here. Seeing no objections. No objections. Okay. Uh, that'll be the order. Uh, um, colleague, oh, I'm sorry. Excuse that, me. Uh, yep, you got to call the vote. I got to um, call the vote since, yep. Yep. Right. On the uh, aforementioned items, um, Council Member Rodriguez, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Council Member O'Farrell? Aye. Council Member Rue? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Very good. Thank you. And if we could please call a separate roll vote for item 13, please. Uh, ma Madam Chair, I, I need to recuse myself for item number 13, so I will be turning off my camera right now. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lee. It has been recused from item number 13. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you'd please call the roll. Okay, ma'am. For item 13, uh, Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member O'Farrell? Aye. Council Member Rue? Aye. You're good. That is everyone then. Okay. Perfect. Mr. Lee has rejoined us. Thank you very much. And uh, colleagues, I want to just double check if we have any speakers. We still oh, we do have, uh, we've received one speaker on uh, item, oh, we don't know. Okay, so, um, okay, we are going to add uh, the public speaker. Aye. Speaker, please state your name and the item that you would like to speak on. Yeah, Rob Kwan, I'd like to speak on item 11. Okay, uh, go ahead, you have one minute. Great. Um, main comment about this is that, uh, you know, the item seeks to assemble relevant stakeholders to talk about reopening the city of Los Angeles and identifies uh, some of those members of the potential working group as being experts from government, academia, and the business community. Um, my only comment on this was I, I think it'd be really helpful for this committee to clarify uh, that, you know, this working group should be uh, diverse, should include labor, um, and I, I think it would only make sense to ensure that um, some of our uh, communities disparately impacted by COVID are included uh, so we can ensure that people who are actually being forced to go out and work and, and risk their lives are, are represented in this working group. Uh, that's the bit of my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, that appears to conclude any additional public speakers that have been on the queue. Uh, so colleagues, that will now bring us to uh, item number 10 on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you please read that item. Item number 10, Los Angeles Fire Department report relative to emergency ambulance fee increases. This matter has also been referred to the Budget and Finance Committee. Thank you. Colleagues, We uh, for this item, we have the fire department and the CAO available on our call for questions. Uh, Muriel G. from the fire department, uh, Ngozi, excuse me, Mumbalu, Mumba, and uh, from the fire department, and uh, Delilah Puche from uh, the CAO's office. And so I'd like to call on the fire department uh, at this time. Let me just pull my agenda item up here. And so uh, I guess Muriel, if you could please provide an overview uh, on this item.
to the middle. Our fire department, who's here from the fire department? Oh, I see Graham. I don't know who's going to be speaking on that item. Please unmute yourself from the fire department. Hello, can you hear me? There you are. Okay, sorry. Uh, good morning. Council members, community staff, city staff, and the public. My name is Ngozi Mbamalu. I'm a senior management analyst in the revenue section of the Los Angeles Fire Department. As part of East Core mission, the Los Angeles Fire Department provides emergency medical services to the citizens of Los Angeles. The resources used in this mission include paramedic rescue ambulances, basic life support ambulances, assessment engines and assessment life forces. In accordance with the city financial policy of food cost recovery, the department is required to recover the cost of these special services to the public. The cost of emergency medical services consists of direct and indirect costs, including salaries, supplies, and expenses, which are related to the operations of the program. These costs determine the emergency ambulance transport service fees. The cost consists of 100% of the cost for paramedic rescue ambulances, basic life support ambulances, and proportional cost of engine companies and life forces that respond to emergency medical incidents. In fiscal year 2019-20, the cost of the program amounted to $405 million. In order to recover these costs, emergency medical incident transport fees must be increased. The proposed fee increase consists of the following. Paramedic rescue ambulance transport from increasing it from 1,452 to 2,463. For basic life support uh, ambulance transport, increasing it from 1,030 to $1,747. And for one way mileage from $19 to 20. This calculation was based on average of 180,503 billable transports. In comparison, the rates for the Los Angeles County as of July 2019 are 2,428 for paramedic transport, 1,620 for basic life transport, and $19 per mile. So the Los Angeles Fire Department is recommending the proposed fees be approved to ensure full cost recovery. Thank you. And I take any questions. Thank you. And uh, colleagues, just uh, if you want to, if you have any questions, uh, but I I'll go ahead and kick it off. Zim, thank you very much. Um, I just, my quick question is, you know, they haven't been assessed or updated in five years. Why has it taken uh, this long for the department to uh, reassess? I have been so many uh, different issues uh, that came up over the years and it hasn't been done, but finally we were able to do it. We did so many trial runs, but for whatever reason, it was yeah, it, it wasn't bring up to council. Is there a reason? What's the reason behind the implementation date being four months away? Uh, we're taking in consideration from the time it's approved, and then the ordinance written, and then uh, billing it, approving it, and billing it. So we're taking all those time in, into account. Okay. All right, thank you. Colleagues, uh, any questions? Uh, Madam Mr. Chair, I have a question. thank you. Uh, what is the percentage of um, percentages of failure to pay on these uh, service fees? Well, you mean percentages of failure to pay? Um, you mean the collection rate? Yes, and, and that's kind of my follow-up question. Uh, how many of these go into collections? So what's our deficit, roughly? Uh, council member, uh, the th we, be, we, we bill it some of the costs, uh, some of the revenue are not collected because some of them are mandated, like the medical, Medicare, the, uh, the government pay is mandated that they pay just so much. So even though we bill the 2,400, for, medic uh, for Medicare, we collect about 500. Mm -hmm. And then for Medicare, we collect about 118. 
So in average, we probably collect about 39% of our billing or 40%. So we're just on the hook for that regardless? Regardless, right. Even okay. though we can bill for it, but we cannot collect it. Um, and then um, uh, when does uh, the, the clock start, start ticking in terms of the charges? Is it, is it the moment the ambulance shows up, for example, or at what point do the fees start generating? Once you get it. Once we get enough information to be able to bill, we bill. Because sometimes we can do the transport, some information are missing, maybe name, address, insurance, all those necessary information needed for billing. If we don't have them, we can bill. Then the, 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 we have a biller, a contract biller that goes and collect those information. Once completed, then we can bill. Sometimes it can take 30 days or we can bill immediately. It depends. I appreciate that, but at what point... Does, is a bill generated? It's not just from the call. It's from the time an emergency unit shows up or from the time someone starts getting aid? Once the, call, once the transport is co uh, completed and is transmitted for billing, then okay. we bill. That, that answers my question. Thank you. Once the transport is completed. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Um, call it Mr. Rue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to follow up on the uh, Councilman O'Farrell's question. So when you say 39% uh, is collected from Medicare, Medi-Cal, so can you explain that a little, little bit more? Meaning um, whether we charge 1,452 or 2,463, is it the same hundred something that's collected? Right. Uh, for, for instance, if we, if we bill for a, uh, a basic life support, the maximum we can collect from the government is 118 and 20 cents. Where is the re remainder? Um, do we ask the hospital to pay, the, 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 the transport person to pay? Who, who, where do we try to collect the rest of the money from? We can, we can collect it. It's mandated adjustment for us. We just adjust it. So then whether we raise this fee or not, it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter for the medical and the Medicare patients. Ah, uh, okay. But for the self-pay, it does. Okay. And then um, so secondarily, um, it, uh, following the ch uh, chairperson's question, um, when I first saw these raises, I saw the uh, sticker shock that it's like 69%, 70%. But LA County Fire, what are, are they, aren't they doing the same rates? Yeah, that's, uh, the last time they approved it was in July 1, 2019, and I can tell you how much they uh, charge. It's about the same rate. For L.A. County, it's about, um, L.A. County currently charges 2428 for paramedics, ALS. What about BLS? BLS, they charge 1620 Okay. Uh, so it's pretty much com comparable. So yeah, yeah right. so initially I saw the uh, sticker shock of how high it went, but then um, yes, if, if LA County Fire is doing the same rate, I, I feel we have to um, uh, be at par. So, um, and same question, I, I kind of missed the answer when uh, the chairperson asked about why did it take so, take so long. Um, for LA County Fire, did they have a drastic increase too the last time they raised it in 2019 or was it incremental for them? LA County does it every year, but they do it differently. They do surveys and they come up with average rates. So every July one, they have an amount. But for us, we have a different process. So what's our process? How often do you update it? We're supposed to do it annually, uh, but we haven't done it a number of years uh, for different reasons. But moving forward, we hope to be able to uh, at least every year or every other year to do it. Can you give us an example of what the reasons were in the past previous years why it wasn't updated? Councilman, I'm not really sure, but I know that we ran some numbers, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't elevated to council level. Well, Madam Chair, can we make? I don't know how you want to do it, but if we could maybe um, make sure the fire department at least a annually. Uh, assess these numbers so that we don't have to do a huge jump like this. And we probably had a loss of revenue in the past five years. Because if we raised it incrementally, we would have gotten a lot more um, uh, revenue. So if we could 
I, I don't know how you want to instruct them, but then um, make sure that they report back every year on this. Well, we can add that instruction to the uh, to the adopted. Uh, we can amend the uh, recommendation. Great. Um, and just one last. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Just one last question. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure these rates reflect a pre-COVID-19 pandemic rate. Um, does, the, does the recent events of the uh, pandemic um, add an extra strain on the department, or do you know how you're going to recoup those costs, or is that factored in at all? No, it's not factored in in the calculation, and how it impacted remains to be seen. Um, but it's not, a, it's not included. It's not part of the calculations. But it will probably affect the number of transports. Like we know that transports are down now for the past few weeks. So it probably impact the number of transports that we transport yearly. But as for the race, the race will stay the same. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Lee? Um, I mean, I, I, like Council Member Ru said, you know, a little bit of sticker shock in seeing these numbers. So. I know that we have our advanced provider our advanced unit or something to to try to address some of the uh, super users out there because I, when I'm going to my fire stations and talking to them about nursing homes or different places are basically using us as a, a taxi service or if someone falls down they don't want the liability so then they call the fire department to pick that person you know back up. Have we put anything else in place to try to address this? Because most of those are Medicare, Medi-Cal patients. Those are the people, you know, those are our super users, and we're getting, uh, well, according to new numbers, probably less than 10%, 10% to the old number, probably, uh, you know, maybe 5% to the new numbers. What are we doing to address, you know, that cost uh, and addressing those, you know, um, same organizations that keep using us over and over and over and over again because you know they use us as basically their own private, their private private shuttle service. I I know that the department is doing some some telemedicine, some uh, uh, rapid responses, but I'm not too familiar with it. So I don't know if uh, somebody on the line from fire department can address. But I know that they're addressing it somehow, but I'm not sure of the details. Is there anyone from the fire department that can answer that? Okay, well, you know, I, yeah. uh, Madam Chair. I know Graham's on. I don't know if Graham is able to answer that question, if he could unmute himself. Or he decided to leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Madam Chair, at least if we can, uh, you know, get a report back on the percentage of uh, you know what the uh, fire department considers the super users uh, for our ambulance services, so we can get a real kind of idea of how big of a problem. I know I you know judging from my own district, I know it's a huge problem, but I'd love to see what that looks like citywide. Um, I don't know how they classify super users, but um, you know, if we can get a report back uh, from the fire department on that, not a problem. Any other questions? Was, did that conclude your uh, questions, Mr. Lee? Great. Um, so, colleagues, uh, I'd like to make the recommendation and move that the committee approve the fire department's recommendations to increase the fees and request the city attorney to draft an ordinance to implement the proposed fee increases. Uh, further move a uh, report back from LA Fire on the percentage of super users and request the department uh, provide an annual uh, reevaluation of these fees going forward. Uh, and uh, did I miss anything, colleagues? I think that captures everything. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Council Member Rodriguez? Aye. Council Member O'Farrell? Aye. Council Member Rue? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. All right. Terrific. Um, all right. So uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, and now that brings us to item number 11 on the agenda.
Item number 11, motion Rodriguez Wezar relative to the reestablishment of business operations after li lifting social distancing orders in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Uh, and oh, sorry, thought I heard something. Um, so colleagues, uh, I want to thank you and I want to thank, uh, uh, I know we have uh, Billy Chun from the mayor's office, our deputy mayor of economic development, uh, as well as uh, Carmina de Santiago mm -hmm. from, uh, mm -hmm. from EMD and uh, our, uh, from the CLA, Tristan Nowak, who's also joining us. And while, you know, we, we know we're in this evolving uh, period of time as we are now starting to uh, receive some of the uh, amended orders from, uh, from the direction of the governor and, of course, our county health officials, um, it's never, I think, too soon for us to engage in a, a very thoughtful dialogue uh, as it relates to how we reopen Los Angeles in a post-corona world. And so, uh, you know, there's going to be a great deal of conversations around this issue. Uh, this is an issue that I think uh, I'd like us to keep active uh, as we, you know, as times evolve uh, and as we continue on with our new committee uh, our, our new way of committee engagement. I think this is a, a, a prudent conversation for us to have here in public safety. It was here in the public safety committee uh, preceding any of the safer at home orders that we engaged uh, in conversations uh, regarding coronavirus. So uh, I really uh, appreciate everybody's participation and an ongoing dialogue uh, on this issue. So at this time, I'd like to call on uh, Deputy Mayor Chun to provide an update on uh, where we stand on the staged approach to uh, lifting restrictions and allowing businesses to resume their operations here in the city of Los Angeles. Billy, thanks for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair, appreciate being here. Uh, good morning, council members. Um, you've kind of laid the, the tone pretty well, especially early on when you said evolving. It is um, definitely an evolving and iterative process, obviously something we've never seen before. I can share what um, kind of what we've been seeing, what we've been working on. Um, granted, you know, as you mentioned, both the state uh, public health as well as the county public health has been issuing a lot of guidance, especially as of yesterday and then within the past week. Um, so we are tracking with them um, and we are uh, talking uh, uh, very frequently just on kind of what their thinking is, what their framework is. Um, obviously, it's a, uh, a very layered and difficult decision on what to open and when. Um, and a lot of it is guidance guided by public health. Um, and so, um, you know, I could kind of share, uh, again, kind of some of what that framework is. Some of the conversations and work um, our office has been doing um, and try to prep for some of this reopening, but as well as, you know, again, like you said, it's an evolving process. Um, you know, there's so many businesses and physical spaces out there. Um, there's no one solution that's going to fit everything. And, uh, you know, I, I think amongst all of us in the city, as well as just government officials, will have this very arduous and just difficult task of just, how we slowly open things up while we're protecting um, the health and safety of our um, residents in LA. Um, so with that, I'll kind of go into kind of a little bit of a glimpse of, again, what we're kind of sensing from public health. Um, and then from our side, uh, what we're doing, and I think kind of going forward, how, how that works out. Um, so again, on the public health side, you know, you know, I don't think it's anything that you haven't all heard of before if you're kind of paying close attention to what the supervisors and what Dr. Ferrer is saying, especially from yesterday, um, again, with the governor's slowly guidance of kind of open, opening things up, you know, we, both county and the city, then have the ability to either track with that or stay more restrictive. But uh, with the county's announcement yesterday of starting to open things up, um, as soon as yet uh, tomorrow and this weekend, um, you know, they're kind of tracking, uh, I would say like basic indicators, not basic, but kind of foundational indicators uh, or metrics. And that's 
a lot of it has to do with just our public health infrastructure. And that's kind of how they're gauging of, you know, it's, I, I think they're sensing that, you know, there's not going to be a perfect environment for them to open. Um, but as long as the environment and the situation today doesn't tax or overtax our healthcare system, then that's the decision of whether or not, okay, what we can open and how little. Um, and so that means just hospital bed capacity, ICU bed capacity, ventilators, PPE supply, testing capacity, um, uh, contact tracing, um, our cases, our death rates, hospitalization rates, um, as well as high risk populations. I think that's kind of, you know, for them, a particular indicator um, uh, kind of addressing those in, that are specifically in high vulnerable populations. Um, so again, that's kind of the foundation that they're constantly tracking um, and trying to get a data of. I, they kind of, as you know, you know, post data every day. Um, and, you know, it's you know, now it, we're sensing that it's better, that we're in a, I can't say a good situation, but in a situation, again, where they're deciding to open things up. So, as you know, you know, tomorrow, you know, and this weekend, they've decided to open up certain retailers, um, basically retailers that could provide for curbside pickup and operations, um, no visitors or customers inside um, the retail stores or operations. That includes um, florists, um, car dealerships, um, apparel, toy stores, sporting goods stores. Um, and, you know, they've laid out a kind of five-stage opening process. Um, and again, this is kind of the county has posted this where, you know, they've kind of laid out what their thought process is of, at this point, logically, what makes sense to open at different phases. They haven't really narrowed in on what those dates are. Um, but again, that's kind of the, what they're thinking of what the progression is. And that's based on a mix of just what the risk is, um, uh, balanced with what the need is, um, you know, and, and that's kind of, it, it's tough because there's no one answer to that. Um, right. So some of the retailers, um, again, you know, that's moderate risk uh, at, that they're seeing that if done right and with proper protocols in place, um, that operations can start opening in those areas. I think where kind of obviously the higher risk uh, categories are, are large assemblies. That's, you know, any kind of large spectator sports uh, or events. Um, I think you know, schools um, are an interesting and, and tough, um, you know, kind of scenario as well. Uh, when you're just introducing a, a large amount of people in a confined space or kind of a limited space that's going in and out, you know, how do you control or kind of monitor those populations? Um, how do you ensure that there's, you know, no one's getting sick? And if so, kind of what, if, what is the reaction to that? So um, that's a general framework. Uh, that we're seeing from um, public health, you know, they are engaging, uh, as you may know, uh, a lot with the private sector as well. Uh, we're tapping into some of the same working groups and task forces that they're talking to um, and just asking and soliciting for feedback of, you know, what are the pain points, what's possible, what's not possible. Um, and they're kind of trying to get that kind of input as much as possible. I don't know kind of the extent of that. I'm not personally involved in a lot of those uh, or any of those working groups or processes. Um, just kind of what I hear from third hand. Um, so if I, if I can, Billy, I'd like to ask a, a quick question. Sure. What latitude, because I mean, even with the mayor's executive orders on essential, non-essential businesses, mm -hmm. uh, it didn't appear that it was always in alignment with either the county directives or even the state directives. So within this kind of framework, mm -hmm. uh, there's still some latitude that we have uh, as a city in terms of this conversation. So uh, what process, and perhaps EMD might want to chime in on this, uh, but what process uh, have we convened here and uh, in terms of setting this framework 
uh, going forward because I think it's important, you know, we're trying to balance all of the needs clearly. Uh, we acted very swiftly in implementing a lot of these safer at home orders to help uh, assure that we were actually uh, getting ahead of the spike. And I think it, it proved very fruitful. Uh, with that, in that same vein, we still, you know, could be the leaders in this conversation in balancing out the needs that we have, both uh, economically for, for the families that are struggling. We've uh, taken a lot of uh, very progressive positions and, and being uh, at the forefront of this, but balancing all that out, what is the conversation right now that we're having as a city? Because we still do have latitude. Uh, and in how we approach this. So what has been the approach uh, right now and with whom, since you're saying that uh, it's not necessarily been uh, directly participating with the county uh, and the working groups that they've established, what are you, in fact, convening perhaps with EMD and uh, in this conversation with uh, some of the uh, executive authority and uh, directives that the mayor has taken thus far? Yeah, um, you're correct, Madam Chair. We do have some latitude um, to uh, either stay um, uh, kind of, we don't have to track uh, exactly with the county. Um, for, from our side, you know, we've also, you know, engaged with industry as well. And a lot of these businesses, um, I will say there's a lot of, uh, the, the good sign is there's been a lot of work already just on private industry in and in itself. Some of it from the member organizations, um, some of it just, you know, a few business leaders just getting together, knowing that there's going to be kind of end to this sometime soon. Um, that So they're starting to plan ahead on their own. Um, so, for example, you know, the local, state, federal, like, restaurant association, they're already putting in work and kind of analyzing what that looks like of how they reopen and what the protocol is like. Is like. Um, the film industry as well, um, the manufacturing. I mean, there's already a lot of good work out there. Um, I'm, we, our office has also, you know, engaged with those and kind of put together some um, business leaders that we think would be good kind of funnels of a lot of that good information that's already out there. Um, oh, the state has one too. The state has their own kind of task forces and working groups as well, um, and so you know, we're charged with trying to funnel a lot of that good information kind of from our side, see what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, because again, it's not one size fits all. Um, and then, you know, we try to do our best to kind of uh, kind of synthesize that into a way that makes sense for the city. Um, you know, generally, I, I say, you know, from, from a lot of our office and with the mayor himself, he talks a lot with both the supervisors and Ferrer and kind of tracking kind of what makes sense and we kind of send them our thoughts and information um, and vice versa. So there is, there is some of that going along and, you know, I will say so far, you know, there hasn't been, you know, too many instances where we, it seems like we would differ um, from the county. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, in all of this, uh, you know, again, there's, we, no one has done this before, but as long as, you know, and we're not endangering public health, but at the same time, try to set up or prepare these businesses for success. Um, that's kind of our that's kind of our framework that we're deciding on moving forward with. Yeah, um, you know, I, I uh, just to kind of preface and kind of you know one of the conversations that I had, and yes, we're all going to be adopt adapting. Uh, as we have right now, uh, how we do business going forward until there is a vaccine, until we've gotten, uh, you know, this circumstance better under control. Uh, that being said, um, we do differ in many respects from the county in that even just our business practice of, for example, I, I will say, you know, if we can, we can cite very very concrete examples of where there's not an alignment uh, when it comes to, say, street vending, for example, and the lack of permitting from the health department uh, that uh, aligns with uh, the work that we've done on the city uh, to advance that work and, and issue permits. Uh, they've, the, they have not met us uh, at an equal level. There are restaurant tours, for example, one that, one that called me earlier this morning 
who had already been conceptualizing how they might spread uh, or create little pockets within the restaurant that would provide, uh, you know, even partition walls and whatnot that might help to facilitate them making greater accommodations uh, for potential clientele so that they could reopen. I cautioned them. I said, listen, you know, don't do it because County Health could have a very different opinion about what might be available and what building and safety might, I mean, the, you know, we've, we've already had misalignments with perhaps, say, building and safety and county health. So, I mean, it's going to be even more important going forward that we make sure that we are, are driving many of these conversations and so that we don't put many of these businesses uh, and many families who are desperately seeking to uh, reemerge uh, their business practice into an environment where, you know, things have historically not been very aligned. And so I, you know, I think it's a, it's an important part of how we, you know, again, I, I think we've got many, many examples. That's just one, uh, but, or a couple, but I think it's really important that we're part of the driving force, just as we've been the driving force in meeting the need of our uh, homeless population and, and facilitating and leading that conversation. We've got LAPD officers uh, that are doing the work of what LASA should have been doing, to be quite honest. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would, you know, I would just urge, and, and colleagues, I want to allow you an opportunity to engage in this conversation as well. I know we're all very eager, um, and I want to thank you for colleagues for also, um, you know, we uh, we convened this conversation around COVID nineteen uh, before uh, it was declared a global pandemic and. Um, you know, I think it's important in the convening of this conversation that we continue to be uh, leaders in the forefront of driving the conversation, of making sure that we're convening everyone uh, around, and of course with uh, with the mayor and, and the executive authority uh, that's been provided to assure that we're actually helping to lead that conversation because, you know, there's, I understand it's a chicken and egg, but at the same time, we've exhibited the leadership that perhaps was slow in other areas, and for uh, you know, for the sense of urgency that many of our residents and our businesses have, and our public safety officials have, um, we've led before. Let's lead again, and I think we can't be slow to engaging in that conversation, uh, you know, going forward, uh, because I think we've been very judicious in terms of our approach. And, uh, and I think it still calls on us to be the leaders that we've been uh, in this area. So uh, I think, Mr. O'Farrell, I'm not sure if you had a question. Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much for your great work on all of this and all the considerations um, that the mayor's office is making of you on, on his behalf. Um, and um, the subject matter that you pretty much covered setting the table for this. And Madam Chair, thank you for your leadership on this. It's, it's something similar effort that we're taking on. We already have an existence, an informal working group, if you will, in relation to the entertainment industry uh, and um, representatives from all the major studios, Film LA, the mayor's office. We're all talking on a regular basis in terms of what will it look like to slowly reopen uh, in a safe and deliberate way on location shoots, for example, even here at City Hall, as it relates to city employees and what all that will look like. So uh, not unlike what you're doing with this uh, initiative, uh, Madam Chair, um, you mentioned contact tracing. In terms of uh, just the general return to a new normal that we all talk about, it's definitely going to take more sophisticated or at least more uh, widely accessible rapid COVID-19 testing. <laughs> Right. So we know that a lot of labs are working on that. Um, it could tell us, uh, give us results within minutes or even hours as opposed to 24 hours, which something that simple could help businesses open much more rapidly. And I feel that those advances will be forthcoming within weeks, not necessarily months. And of course, the backdrop, as you already said, Madam Chair, is um, 
an actual vaccine. Um, and of course, we need therapeutics that work uh, for those uh, infected with COVID-19. So um, what I'm uh, also, I also want to acknowledge the caller who phoned in earlier and mentioned in terms of a working group, uh, I agree, it should absolutely uh, encompass people who have already been out there daily since the very beginning of the pandemic in the, ne the necessary uh, services. Uh, supermarkets, the, the fellow that I always check out from when I go to Target, for example. I mean, everyday people who have been out there experiencing the real effects of the pandemic, I think w should be invited into a working group as well. Um, and of course, you know, labor, someone from the trades who's on a construction job, for example. So I think those are all good ideas along with academics and business leaders, et cetera, so that we get a, a, a more full picture um, of, of, you know, so we can be informed more adequately. Um, and taking a look at some of the countries that have either slowed the infection rate or stopped it altogether. I mean, take a look at, there are some examples you can look to, Iceland, Vietnam, um, and within that, there are a lot of factors that have helped them be successful. Some of them wouldn't work here, like completely closing the borders, things like that. So uh, we have a lot to think about. This working group will have a lot to think about, but it's definitely heading in the right direction to see um, what uh, is possible. And in terms of uh, phase two of the pandemic and the emergency orders, I, I hope that uh, the mayor uh, and the, certainly the county will consider other uh, industries, other businesses, for example, pet care, dog grooming, things like that which can be done very safely, I think. Um, and I hope that that list um, will be um, growing in the, in the shorter term so, so that we can put even more people back to work. Um, but, but thank you, I think this is something great. Uh, and it's always good to have people with experience in the particular field that we want to you know, bring back uh, to give input for, for this so that we can move forward in a very informed way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell. Um, Mr. Rue, did you have a question? Sure. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you so very much. And thank you for your leadership on this. Um, you know, uh, this is probably for the Deputy Mayor. I thank you for joining us and letting us, giving us an update of everything that's happening. <clears throat> you know, um, as the uh, 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 reopening plans start to go forward, um, is there I know there's a task for the mayor's task force, and I know the mayor gives a briefing every day at 515, which is televised in pretty much every uh, news station, which is great. But um, is there any um, other conscious effort or any plan to communicate with businesses regarding the plan? Uh, because even though there's a wide array of outreach, I mean, as you know, uh, there's, there's no such thing as enough outreach, right? There's always people who don't know and people who are confused, especially when the city, the county, or the state uh, differ by a little fraction, right? And people get very confused. Is there other ways of, uh, of to communicate with businesses? Um, maybe possibly, uh, I don't know if it, obviously the Chamber of Commerce don't represent all businesses either, but is there another way um, besides everything that's being done now? I mean, it, I think that's, uh, I mean, that's a good point because, you know, even leading up to this communication and awareness, both from the business side and the public and customer side is so important, even you know, in preparation for opening. I mean, that's that's one of the that's one of the feedbacks um, we've heard from businesses. Um, you know, it, you know, there yes, there's our like chambers or bids. Those are natural. We found it just in general a little difficult, just because we are all quarantined. Like you don't have the natural, you know, like meetings or just like. Uh, some of these nonprofits organizations that's in the neighborhood that are open to like disseminate or push out stuff through other areas that you wouldn't normally do through social media or just through email. So, um, I mean, th that's something that um, I would love, you know, if there are ideas out there on how we push those out. Um, I would love to hear those ideas and kind of work together and try to push those messaging out um, because it is going to get, you know, this is the, 
the early part of it as it starts rolling out even more and more. And again, you know, you know, the messaging is has to be important that if we roll out, there's a chance we roll back. Um, that has to be abundantly clear, depending on how, you know, the cases are, like our hospital beds and our test capacity. There could be a time and a scenario where it could get worse that we have to roll back and start closing things down. So even that messaging has to be abundantly clear that it's just not all, you know, we, it's just a linear line to full opening. But um, I mean, that's a good point, Councilman, that we need, there needs to be a considered effort to just be able to push a lot of that messaging out. Thank you. And you know, uh, my second question is in the lines of what uh, our, our chairperson was talking about. Um, I know it's very difficult because there's so much things happening at the same time and everything's coming at us. Um, and and, and, it, and in many cases, I know um, even your the mayor's office is getting last minute information from either the state or the county, even though the mayor is in constant contact, like you said, with the county or the supervisors and, and, and the public health director. Um, but um, going forward, love to have uh, even more um, communication um, so we could uh, be um, uh, involved in what's going on and so we could also properly disseminate the information and help you disseminate the information to our districts um, and to all the various organizations in our districts. But um, yeah, it, it is a little frustrating, uh, but we do know, and sometimes we find out last minute, um, but it, that's just the nature of a pandemic. Because obviously uh, we have to be able to move uh, quickly on a dime and quickly in, in a, and things change often on an hour's notice. Um, so uh, very respectful of that. And the mayor has been very communicative um, of everything that he tries to give us a preview of everything that he's doing. But um, I don't know what the solution is, but we would love, um, I concur with the chairperson um, about trying to do something on that. And Madam Chair, I know your, uh, your uh, motion that you introduced was really uh, ahead of the curve. Um, you introduced this motion before anything else happened. So I wanted to uh, ask you, um, since the mayor does technically have a task force, was your now intent to kind of uh, create a new task force or just since it's already te technically done at the executive office, I, w I wanted to see where your direction was because I wanted to maybe then add on that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think this is still a very nimble conversation uh, given the circumstances. In fact, uh, you know, we were unable to even have county health participate, for example, in today's uh, committee meeting so that we could be very directive. Uh, in our questions and help to frame uh, how I think we go forward. But I, uh, you know, I think there are a number of uh, similar efforts that are being convened. Obviously, the goal isn't to be duplicative. It's to help make sure that we have all of the right uh, convening of conversations and, uh, and focus groups, as, as Mr. O'Farrell mentioned, with uh, obviously uh, given uh, his expertise and, and uh, very close work with uh, the entertainment industry, uh, given the presence in his district, I think we're each kind of in a, in a circumstance where we're able to contribute. Um, but I would also say, just in terms of, uh, you know, Mr. Chun and, you know, appreciate all the different, you know, everyone's getting pulled in a thousand different directions. Um, but, you know, given the executive authority, for example, we, we recognize even within our own uh, the limitations of our own power uh, as, uh, uh, as a municipality of what we can or cannot do. Uh, but it was through the uh, mayor's authority of de uh, declarations of essential and non-essential businesses, for example, that we could help to provide even greater relief to certain families. For example, uh, even the motion of, uh, that I introduced uh, that was approved by this council seeking to have uh, collections uh, of uh, you know, you know the repossessions and collections and and seeking uh, that declaration of a non-essential business uh, because of the exposures that it was providing to families in their own homes. We didn't need the repo man showing up right now. Um, so I think it would be very worthwhile in terms of this body and our convening and and uh, the role of this city council and its shared intent uh, to help support the uh, reemergence of business safely in Los Angeles uh, and a safer, you know, re-engaging and re-emerging in, in uh, safe uh, uh, 
resu resuming of, a, of what had been a normal way of life, uh, that we make sure that there's uh, this open dialogue uh, with the city council and the mayor's office uh, in our shared responsibility to make sure that we're, we're eager to, uh, to bring us all back to a, to a safe uh, daily operation and, uh, and understand that, uh, you know, what we're seeking is, uh, you know, there's a mutual understanding and commitment uh, to provide relief to families at this time and uh, doing all that we can to make sure that we're uh, supporting the efforts of our local businesses, families that are eager to get back to work. Um, you know, many of us have been very busy triaging, and uh, I've got eight food pantries in my district. Each of us can talk about the, you know, what we're doing to help re-engage uh, small businesses to find a, a business opportunity given the circumstances so that they're not forced to close their businesses. But um, just, to, just to kind of provide that very clear reminder uh, that you have individuals here with uh, not just uh, the expertise given the areas that they represent and their constituencies, but uh, a shared commitment to uh, identifying where perhaps uh, because of the governor or the county's orders, we still have an opportunity to lead and provide relief and uh, lead in an area where we do, in fact, have latitude to lead. So uh, just, to, just to reaffirm that uh, and convey that to you uh, and the mayor, uh, that you know, we're, we're all here to work collaboratively and constructively and to provide relief uh, for families at this time. Mr. Lee, uh, did you have any questions? No, Madam Chair, just to reiterate what everyone else is saying. I mean, especially your last sentiment of just from Mr. Chen, just to make sure that you know, the mayor's office is constantly in contact with us and working with us as a council. Uh, you know, it's good to know information ahead of time for you know the mayor. Sometimes announces it so that you know we can work with our communities and and start working on different ways to uh, work out any programs that he's working on or to help out. We just want to be there to to be able to assist the mayor uh, moving forward. And yeah, that's my only thing. And other than say. Billy, I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thanks, colleagues. And uh, Billy, I, I actually have a question, uh, and you know, it's about, and I, you know, Mr. Mr. O'Farrell raised it, um, and it's an an issue that I don't know anyone's really uh, considered, but a lot of the mobile services that are available. Uh, you know, I know the county uh, the county provides a lot of uh, permitting in that, uh, but is there a regulatory uh, agency in our city uh, that is required to provide oversight on some of those uh, mobile industries? So, for example, there's a lot of, uh, you know, at-home uh, personal care in addition to car wash service or uh, mobile... Uh, you know, mobile pet grooming uh, is under whose jurisdiction does that fall under outside of the county for, for example, uh, you know, for uh, personal or, or the county or even the state, for example, right, for estheticians or hair grooming, who, uh, who in the city would help to regulate that? Yeah. And, uh, oh, and I forgot to mentioned, I totally agree, Councilman, on pet grooming. But uh, um, uh, no, that's a good question. I mean, there's, as far as I know, there's no function in that in the city or with any department. And um, because there's that flexibility of, you know, generally we don't, you know, have oversight or, or track uh, any kind of, uh, unless, it's, unless it's being brought to our attention, any kind of activity in a, in a personal residence. So they're, you know, they're, there is not. There is not that. Um, right. Yeah. But, and and I and I raise that as again an opportunity for I think us to lead in this city because uh, in terms of their ability to maintain safe social distancing, safe practices, whatever the guidelines are, um, those are independent small business owners. Uh, those are folks that perhaps could uh, again because they're not going to be convening large groups. Uh, you know whether it's. You know, again, I, you know, again, I, the, the safe social practice and, for example, 
you know, manicures or what have you, but I'm, it, it's something to consider and an area for us to be thoughtful to advance uh, safer guidelines and practices that these are small independent business owners that perhaps might be able to uh, reemerge their businesses uh, sooner than perhaps even a uh, brick and mortar shop and it's something for everyone to consider. Um, but again, I think an area of opportunity for us to engage in that conversation and lead uh, with the broader guidance of whatever the, uh, the state and the county guidelines are. But uh, I think uh, we should be, you know, again, we, we've never been afraid to lead in the city of Los Angeles. I think, no, you know, uh, today is no different. And uh, I think we should be, you know, again, plenty of, uh, plenty of us uh, interested and, and uh, available to engage in that conversation. Madam Chair, if I may, uh, afterward. No, go ahead, Mr. O'Fallon. Um, I just want to say that uh, I, I support where you're going with this. I mean, think about the variety of delivery services that are available or, uh, yeah, or, or on site where they, they come to you. I mean, we already get deliveries for groceries and, and things like that. Um, there are companies that will pull up and they'll clean your rugs and then they'll take off. There are you know, companies that do all sorts of things. Um, and this can all be done safely and with social distancing, especially services related to your home, since people have been sheltering in place for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, there's probably going to be a need for various services related to one's home at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. So I like where you're going with that, uh, thinking about how we can help encourage uh, small businesses to continue not just surviving because we're, we're all pushing for that and working on resources to help that be achieved, but uh, to help them thrive uh, as well as, as we ease, ease into, like I said earlier, this new sense of normalcy. Uh, so I just want to support where you're going with that line of thinking. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Um, you know that, that's a that's a good point. Um, you know, and that, and, and I think that's um, that emphasizes just the caring from those small businesses because I think, in their sense, obviously they don't know where all of this is going to end up. They don't know how this is going to affect their business. And if anything has taught us throughout all these years that, you know, entrepreneurs in Los Angeles are always willing to adapt and think of new opportunities and new way of doing their business. And so they're going to adapt. They're going to, you know, they're going to adjust their business or find a business that in ways that we've never seen before. Um, so I think having that dialogue with that business is on the one hand to help them, but also to guide them on how to do that safely and properly. Um, again, I, I echo, I, I like where, you know, that's going, that working with those businesses in order to also not only give them opportunity, but also guide them in the right way. I, I think that um, that makes a ton of sense. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. Okay. I know we had uh, EMD and the, and the, we still have you on the call. Are you guys? EMD, are you there? Carmina? I don't see her. Still there, I think I think we've lost it. Okay. All right. Um, so, colleagues, I think uh, I think this was a very good uh, first kind of uh, part of the discussion to engage in. Uh, Billy, thank you for being for joining us today. And uh, again, I, I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for us to lead uh, in an area that perhaps isn't, you know, again discussed. We're the city of Los Angeles. We're not always here to just take orders. We're here to lead, and uh, you have a, a, a very uh, committed council that has been leading on a number of fronts uh, with respect to COVID. I think it has contributed uh, in many respects to uh, our greater success rate in comparison to other cities around the world. 
uh, in terms of how we've uh, combated this pandemic. Um, I, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, our uh, members of law enforcement uh, and uh, our fire department for stepping in to, to play a significant role uh, in areas where, you know, perhaps even the county wasn't best prepared to lead in terms of uh, supporting the mobile testing, uh, the support at our um, interim uh, homeless facilities that have been accommodated at uh, Rec and Parks facilities. And again, I also, you know, and, and, our, and my thanks to Rec and Park staff uh, who went from, you know, being at the forefront of uh, being subject matter expertise and in active recreation for, for youth and programming at our, uh, at our parks facilities to being uh, at the forefront of accommodating, uh, providing housing for our uh, most vulnerable populations at this time. So uh, my thanks to everybody and then of course in honor of, uh, of uh, our uh, incredible nurses and the work that they've been doing. I know we're all honoring their work as well, but um, this is, a, this is a, no means a, a singular effort. It's, a, it's a teamwork at its best and uh, we're here to keep that momentum going forward. Um, so with that, colleagues, I'd like to move uh, that we hold this item in committee so that we can continue this dialogue. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Clerk, if you want to, uh, if we, I believe, cleared the desk. We have cleared the desk, Madam Chair. Thank you, colleagues. And uh, with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you.